are two core, two systems of chords. Ten, Mississippi. To do the fourteenth. Um, all right, Secretary of State. Secretary of State deals with everything outside of America. Deals with everything outside. Hi, and welcome back to Mr. Raymond's Civics EOC Academy. Just a reminder, while these videos were designed for students taking the civics and, of course, exam in the state of Florida, these videos will help for anyone taking civics or U.S. government. So chances are, if you found them, you're in the right place. So today we're going to be looking at two philosophers who influenced the founding fathers, and they are John Locke and Charles Louis de Montesquieu, who has a much longer name than that, but we'll just call him Montesquieu. So for the next couple of lessons, we're going to go back to the founding of the United States before we actually were the U.S. And really, we were still a colony of the English. Uh, settlers in America, for the most part, had been ruling themselves from the time of Jamestown in 1607 with very little supervision from the British. However, that changed in the mid-1700s. And we're going to be going over that in much more detail in some later or some upcoming videos. But what you need for, to know for now is that it was around this time, the mid-1700s, that Americans started thinking about creating their own nation. They were looking around for ideas about what type of government, what type of nation they should create. And so they were looking for inspiration. And this brings us to our benchmark, which is recognize how enlightenment ideas, including Montesquieu's view of separation of power and John Locke's theories related to natural law and the social contract influenced the founding fathers. Now, we see in bold there the things we need to know. We need to know what the Enlightenment is. We need to know what Montesquieu's view of separation of powers is. John Locke's theories on natural law and the social contract. Okay, so it kind of tells us all we need to know right there. Um, but before we look at that, just a little refresher. Hopefully you know some of the founding fathers. There's George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin, probably our three best known founding fathers. But they left out some of my favorites, like John Adams uh, and James Madison, and of course, Alexander Hamilton, who you probably all have a picture of whenever you have a $20 bill. Um, but you're going to learn more about those as well in the upcoming videos. So these were the guys who were the leading figures during the 1760s and 1770s, and they were calling for two things. First of all, they were saying, hey, England, we want to be our own country. And secondly, we think we have a better idea for a government so that we won't be ruled by kings and aristocracies. So they're really looking for inspiration in what we see are bullets there for creating governments and writing constitutions, uh, establishing what types of rights they want, and pretty much just creating a new country when they got rid of the British. Now, this was a time period known as the Enlightenment, or as some refer to it as the Age of Reason. Now, the Enlightenment or age of reason, those are pretty good clues as to what this period was all about. Because if someone is enlightened, it means that they are well informed and educated and basically smart. Now, to reason, reasoning is the power of the mind to think and understand and form judgments. So both of these words really tell us that People during this time period wanted to be more knowledgeable and educated and to think about how to make things better. Now here we see some of the Enlightenment's big ideas, how reason can be used to solve problems and improve people's lives, ignoring superstition, and that's probably talking about religion, kind of how we could have, we saw that natural world 
we know that's one of John Locke's ideas. So kind of how human behavior could be governed by these laws that don't necessarily have to come from the government. So let's look at that a little further. So our first philosopher and a philosopher is a person that's kind of like a professional thinker. Okay, they, they thought about life and reality and kind of why things are the way they are and, and ultimately how things could be better. Okay, so our first philosopher, John Locke, he was pretty famous during the Enlightenment. And he wrote about government in particular with his famous book, we see there, Two Treatises of Government. Now, one of Locke's big ideas was to consider what, would, what life would be like in what he called a state of nature. Now, I always ask my students, what would life be like if there was no government? There weren't any laws. And usually the answers I get are that things would be pretty crazy. Okay. And John Locke would agree with this. Well, he thought people were good, basically. He also thought man was naturally greedy and that this would lead him to harm others. Uh, kind of like we see down in that picture there, a state of nature, one guy chasing the other one. Think about it if there was no government. And let's say that I have, I'm living in a state of nature and I have a lot of possessions. Maybe I have a lot of food. And my neighbor, who, by the way, is much bigger than me, uh, has none. What do you think would happen in that situation? He would probably come over, beat me up, and take it, right? So we need some protections. Or as Locke said, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. So John Locke's main thought on natural law was that laws must be enacted to protect natural rights. And these rights, he broke down into these three things, life, liberty, and property. And you have to remember that. That's a big EOC question, okay? Once again, John Locke thought we need government to protect our life, our liberty, and our property. Now, to Locke, this was pretty much the only purpose for government, to protect these three things. And Locke knew from firsthand experience what, it w what happens when a king has too much power. Locke lived in a time where Great Britain was struggling over how much power the king should have. In fact, his father fought in what was known as the English Civil War, which was between Parliament and the king, and his father fought against the king. So while he was speaking about the need for a government to protect our rights, he also knew we needed protection from government itself. So here we have his quote, the natural liberty of man is to be free from any superior power on earth and not to be under the authority of man, but only to have the law of nature for his rule. So for Locke, it was about finding that balance between needing protection and also having our rights. In addition to his ideas on natural law, John Locke is famous for his thoughts on what is known as the social contract, sometimes referred to as the social compact. And this is a great diagram I found that explains the social contract. And here we have his quote, civil government is, prop is the proper remedy for the inconveniences of the state of nature. And what are some of these inconveniences? Well, people stealing, people killing. So we see that people give away some of their power to the government or, or transfer it. And what do they get back? Well, they get back security and protection. Again, for life, liberty, and property. Now, some things that are missing from this chart, I would add a legislature and also, we transfer more than just power in this equation. We give away the rights to do things that will hurt other people. For instance, in a social contract, I give up the right to drive 100 miles per hour down the street, but I get back protection that you won't drive 100 miles per hour down the street and you won't run me over in your car, okay? 
So this is the definition I would use for social contract. And it says that people enter into a quote unquote agreement with the government and must give up the right to do certain things, but they get back protection from the government. The reason I put this agreement in quotes is that no one signs this contract. Okay, this is a social contract. We live by the contract through our actions and our interactions with other people. And what happens when we break the contract? Well, we get into trouble. If we break it really badly, they will put us into a cage, which they call jail. We see this cartoon down here. You don't kill me and I won't kill you. Hey, seems great. Okay, so let's get back to our second part of that benchmark. And it says, how does this influence the founding fathers? So I put a chart up here. John Locke's writings were huge amongst the founding fathers. I like to tell my students about when I went to Thomas Jefferson's home, Monticello, in Charlottesville, Virginia, he had a painting of John Locke on the wall. Kind of like you had that Justin Bieber poster up on your wall. Uh, Thomas Jefferson has been accused of plagiarizing John Locke when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Now, we're going to come back to this when we learn about the Declaration, uh, but let's look at the stuff that Tommy J borrowed. Okay, Locke spoke of natural rights, while Tommy J wrote of unalienable rights, this strange word, unalienable, and that meant rights that couldn't be taken away. Locke spoke of the social contract or governments getting their power from the people, and Jefferson said governments get their power from the consent of the people. Consent of the governed, and we're going to come back to that. Uh, Locke said that governments should protect life, liberty, and property, and Jefferson changed it up a little bit to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which in America, pursuing happiness usually just means we buy more stuff anyway. So was Jefferson influenced by Locke? You betcha. Okay. Now let's move on to our next philosopher, and that is Montesquieu. And we'll get through this one much quicker because this is really straightforward. Uh, Montesquieu was another Enlightenment philosopher who spoke about government, and Montesquieu is known for what is called separation of powers. Uh, here he have this, we have his quote, uh, when the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or in the same body of magistrates, there can be no liberty. So what he's saying is that the king should not be able to make laws and enforce them. For example, a king should not be able to decide how much taxes you pay and then go around and collect those taxes. So what Montesquieu suggested was that we take all the power we give to the government and divide it three ways so that no part of the government would have too much power. This would lead in America to what we call checks and balances uh, which we'll go over later, but this is a system where each branch of the government limits or checks the other branches of the government so that all of the power is balanced out. So did this influence our, our founding fathers when they created a new government? I think you know the answer to that. Of course it did, or we wouldn't be learning it. Um, we have a legislative branch, which we call Congress, and Congress makes the laws. Uh, we have an executive branch headed up by the president, and the president enforces the laws. And we have a judicial branch headed by the Supreme Court, and their job is to interpret or to judge the laws. So we see Montesquieu's uh, influence on American government our division of the government into three branches. So let's review. First of all, the Enlightenment was a time of learning and knowledge and philosophy. For John Locke, you have to remember these three things that John Locke uh, was known for natural law, the social contract, and his influence on the Declaration of Independence. 
and then finally we have Montesquieu and separation of powers and checks and balances okay so if you memorize these you're definitely gonna ace your exam all right and finally we have to remember both of these guys and the Enlightenment itself it influenced the founding fathers okay it helped them come up with inspiration for creating the US government and the way that we created it well I hope you learned something Keep up the good work and be sure to subscribe for more videos and thanks for watching.